Hey guys, it's Aussie Firebug here, back with another post. Um, and today's post is our investing strategy explained. So I wanted to really go into um, what we're trying to do with our investing and how we're actually going to get into the real guts of how we're going to reach financial independence using our strategy. Because a lot of people have written um, how exactly is it going to work in retirement and all stuff like that. So that's why I wanted to make this post to explain everything and also to give a little bit of um, history of how we got to where we're where we are at today. So pretty much um, if you follow most online fire bloggers, whether it be um, Aussies or internationals, you might start to see a pattern emerge more often than not. Majority of these early retirees are living off an income stream generated by returns from index investing, which I'll go into in a minute. Um, so in the beginning, when I very when I first started investing, um, I come across the term financial independence in a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Hope I pronounced that right. And um, it really struck a chord with me because it was so simple. You buy assets and they make you money and eventually you get to a point where you have so many assets that they make so much money that you don't have to work to live. That was really mind blowing for me. Uh, must have been about five or five and a half years ago when I first read that. I was like, wow, that just makes so much sense. I understand that. Um, why isn't everyone trying to do this? Uh, now, I already had back then, I think it was, uh, I don't know, 2013, somewhere, somewhere like that. I already had the um, the savings and frugal part down. I was just always being a good saver and pretty frugal my whole life. But I'd never invested in anything outside of a savings account, which led me to pick up my next book in my quest towards fire from zero to 130 properties in 3.5 years by Stephen McKnight. This was a book because the Rich Dad Poor Dad book I found was good for the fundamentals and the theory and stuff like that, but it didn't really tell you how to invest or it didn't really give you a specific uh, blueprint to how to get to financial independence. Whereas this book by Steve McKnight really was uh, a property investing book and it actually laid out um, heaps of different strategies, common strategies property investors have used for decades to reach financial independence so that's why and it's, it's, it's a best sale and i really like it and i think uh steve mcknight's my favorite uh property investing author out there so i really i really like that book it was a few years old when i read it um but it really just it made a lot of sense to me i read it, it was it was very practical in, in its advice um so it's a really good book so if you haven't haven't read it and you're in, interested in property investing definitely pick it up um so i think um, real estate is probably the most popular investing class in the country by a country mile um, because I guess it makes sense that our parents um, have seen or experienced uh, incredible real estate booms in the past without any real crashes happening in the last 25 years. So my parents uh, also invested in real estate. So there was a bit of comfort knowing that um, I had a bit of guidance there that I could draw from. Um, you know, mum and dad have been through it. So if anything come up, they could mentor me through it. So that was sort of the 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 asset class that I gravitated towards. When, when I read about this financial independence, I was like, how am I going to create this income stream? And property was just the, um, the obvious choice in my mind at that stage uh, to go down because I'd see mum and dad made a whole bunch of money off it and um, yeah, they could, they could mentor me through it. And it's pretty easy to grasp too. You know, you buy a house, you rent it out, you collect the rent, uh, the rent covers the expenses, hopefully, and you sell it at a high price um, and make a profit. Um, the other pop popular strategy with real estate is you buy strong cash flow properties and where they bring in a surplus of rent after all expenses and you live off the rent. But this strategy is really hard to do at the moment in today's market because of the because of the low rental yields in Australia. Um, so with time on my side uh, for letting my investments grow for a decade or for decades, um, my first strategy to reach financial independence was to create an income stream through real estate. And it went something like this. If I could buy 10 investment properties and hold them for 10 years, I could sell half of them and pay off all my debts. Because you know, the old saying goes, property doubles every seven to 10 years, which 
we really know is not true, but that's how the old saying does go. Uh, so after 10 years, I'd have five houses uh, pulling in rent with no interest repayment. So I'd sell five and I'd keep the other five and I would have, I would reach financial independence this way. Um, and if you're reading this uh, or you're, you're watching this through YouTube, you can see that the tables here, um, like I start off with 10 investment properties, uh, the equity is 3 million, my loan's 2.4. And then if we fast forward 10 years, the theory was was hopefully going to be I had my 10 investment properties, the equity had doubled and gone to 6 million, but I'd still only had $2.4 million worth of loans and the rent had gone up, but the expenses have also gone up a little bit. So then I would sell, I'd have five investment properties, $3 million worth of equity, and the rent coming in would be 100 grand and my expenses would be 15 grand a year, which leaves 85 grand to live off a year, uh, which is extremely good. That's definitely financial independence for us. Um, so I was well on my way with this strategy. Um, I purchased my third investment property in 2015, and it was around this time that I discovered Mr. Money Mustache and index investing, which I'll go into in a, in a little bit. Um, so this, the strategy that I just explained with the real estate, um, that's, this has worked for thousands of Aussies and it really isn't a new strategy. I think if you talk to most people in real estate, um, and especially it, it appears to be, um, baby, boom, baby boomer parents, that sort of is a common, you know, advice, like buy a house, wait 10 years, double and sell it and, you know, make all this money. So it, it really isn't anything new. But um, there was a few things that uh, made me reconsider this strategy and ultimately why I decided to move to a new one. The first being that strategy one, being the real estate strategy, relies on capital growth. You can see in the first table, and again, you can only see this if you're actually watching this or you've read the blog post, um, there's nearly a 20K difference between the rent and the expenses when I start the strategy. So I have the 10 properties, the theoretical of course, but this is what was I was planning to do. Um, so there was a 20K difference, a gap between the rent and expenses. What's not factored in here is negative gearing, which all my properties are negatively geared, but they're cash flow positive because of the tax refund I receive. The properties pay for themselves. But I couldn't actually ever retire of this off this cash flow which is why the capital gains is imperative. Imperative, which without the capital gains in this strategy, it just doesn't work. The capital gains only works if someone buys the asset at a higher price than what you paid for it. And I I just never felt comfortable breaking even or making a tiny profit each year with the hopes that 10 years down the track, everything would pay off. I felt investing should be like a snowball approach where you start off with a small trickle of pa passive income and see it grow into a raging torrent over the years. So as I was going on to my third property and I was planning to go on to my fourth, that was always lingering in my mind that I, I feel I feel like it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't have to wait so many years for it to all pay off. Um, so that was just in the back of my head. And the second reason um, we decided to, to change strategies, me, me and my partner, is the active investment um, part of property investing. There's just no way around it. Um, managing property requires time and effort. When I first started, I had all the enthusiasm and motivation in the world, and I wanted to do everything I could to reach fire as quickly as possible. And that meant that I was doing, um, you know, renovations, sweat equity. I was going down, traveling an hour to my investment property, um, you know, landscaping, doing the garden, help build the deck, everything like that. Anything I could you know, put in physically into the investment, I was willing to do just because I was so pumped up of reaching fire as quickly as possible. But five years later, my motivation for doing all that extra stuff has really fallen off a cliff. Uh, I would, I'd much rather focus on other things than worrying about managing my investments, to be honest. Um, to be fair, my, my properties haven't been too much of a hassle um, at the moment, uh, but in the original strategy, I'd have 10 properties, which I could imagine, you know, that's, that's a lot of properties to manage. So uh, properties at the moment are pretty good, touch wood, but um, yeah, 10, 10 is a lot. And the third reason, which ultimately swayed my decision or made my decision for me really, is around 2016, 
the APRA, which is the Australian Australian Prudent Regulations Authority, made it extremely hard for investors to with, withdraw equity and refinance their loans. This was to try to curb risky lending and make it harder for property investors, which I think wasn't a bad decision, to be honest, because it was getting a little bit out of control, so they had to do something. So I wasn't fully against it. Um, interest rates went up on all my loans, and there were so many more hoops that I had to jump through to withdraw equity. Uh, it was about 10 times harder than it was in 2014 and 15 when I did it. Um, and looking back now, I was actually very fortunate to get into property when I did because interest rates were being cut and banks were financing loans a lot easier. Um, if I was to try to get three investment properties in today's market, there's no way I could do it. They just banks would not lend the money for me to be able to do it. So I went to inquire about my fourth loan and I was basically denied, you know, too much um, debt, <clears throat> not enough income, whatever. You can't get another loan. So my dream of the 10 properties was out of reach. But if I wasn't going to reach financial independence through real estate, how was I going to create the passive income stream? Which leads us on to strategy two, index investing. So around about this time that I got denied or I figured out that I couldn't uh, get another loan for the fourth property, um, it was really when I really started reading Mr. Money Moustache, um, ex uh, Early Retirement Extreme, a whole, whole bunch of US related blogs because there was no fire Aussie blogs back then. Um, just really getting into it. These guys overseas, they're retired early. They're doing what I want to do. How are they doing it? And I noticed that a lot of them were doing it through this index investing style. And Mr. Money Moustache, and I think um, anyone that's read him, he has a really good writing style, which uh, people relate to, I guess. And I read two articles. I read the shocking, shockingly simple, simple, simple math behind early retirement, which I got a link in the post, and his article about index investing. And there was something about those two articles that just made sense to me. It just clicked everything he wrote. I was like, yes, that that makes sense. That's what I want to do. Um, and it really was the catalyst for my desire to learn more about the stock market because it's it's really funny the stock market when people um, the very few people that know that my partner and I have six figure sums invested in the stock market it usually unless there's someone that invests themselves it goes something like oh aren't you scared you're you're gonna lose it all you know one minute's there one minute it's not um, it's you know. You can't see and touch it. Don't you feel scared? Which I was completely like that as well before I started learning more about the stock market. Um, and the news outlets don't really help the situation either. They're constantly reporting on stock market crashes and how billions were wiped out um, in mere hours, yada, yada, yada. So it really puts fear into people's mind and property is never really talked about like that as much, like unless a massive crash happens because the price of property isn't updated every 15 minutes. It's hard for outlets, I guess, and people to really get a true indication of the price, which is like it, which is a, a, a positive for property really because people don't panic sell because they don't know if it's crashing or, you know, stuff like that. Um, the stock market, every, everyone's like telling us, you know, don't, don't put your money in the stock market. It's, isn't it too scary? But I think if people really under, just took the time to understand how the stock market works, and what index investing is, they'd be pleasantly surprised to find out all the positives that come with this style of investing. So what actually is an index? When I talk about index investing, like what is an index? Um, an index is, or indices cover almost every industry sector and asset class, including Australian and international shares, property, bonds, and cash. So there's these, there, there are these companies that conduct and public financial research and, an and analysis on stocks, bonds, and commodities to create indexes. One of the more <clears throat> popular companies that publish these indexes um, is Standards and Poor's. So you might have seen the S&P in front of a lot of like index trackers. That's because these the company, the Standard and Poor's, um, you know, they do all the research to like figure out these indexes. So that's what that is. Um, and have you ever like listened on the finance news and they've, they've been talking about the all ordinaries and it's sometimes they refer to it as the, the all ords and wondered like what the hell are they talking about? The all ords is Australia's oldest index of shares and consists of the top 500 largest companies 
by market capitalization in Australia. So that's what that is. It's actually an index. So if, I've got a few graphs in the post. And if you look at the, um, the S&P uh, ASX 200, which is the top 200 companies trading on the ASX by market cap since 1992, you can see a nice little graph there and you can see the the price of all that whole index as a whole, you know, go up, go down, it spikes around 2007 and then it comes crashing down when the GFC hit and then it goes up, it goes down, it goes up and up. And then I've got one below it, which is the Dow Jones, which is the US index. Uh, and I've got the historic data of that index for the last 60 years. And you can see, you know, trends along, trends along, it goes, it goes up, up, up around 2000. And then it comes crashing down. That was the dot com um, bust that happened there. And then it goes up, up, up. And then it comes crashing down with the GFC. And then it's been on a pretty big bull run uh, for the last, like, I don't know, nine years or so. It's been, you know, just shooting up like that. And then the last graph, the graph I have is the Financial Times Stock Exchange. Um, which is a top 100 index uh, on the Lon London Stock Exchange by market cap. And you can have a look at that and you can sort of see the dot-com um, bust happen and the GFC happen also. And why am I showing these graphs? Because the thing I want to illustrate is the there's a lot of trends in all three graphs, but the overall trend, which should be glaringly obvious, is the index is trending up given a long enough time and taking away all the peaks and troughs, the overall trend on most indexes, any index actually I can think, I can't think of one index where given enough time it's not going up, it's it's trending up. So <clears throat> that's a fundamental, pr fundamental principle of index investing that these, throughout the decades, these companies are trending um, you know, up and they're, they're producing dividends, which I don't think the dividends are actually accounted for in those graphs, which make it even better because the dividends are getting paid out to the shareholders. All the companies are re like are retaining the dividends and reinvesting it in the company, which as a byproduct will create the um, price of the share to go up or it should. Um, so index investing Another principle of it is that it's hard, it's really hard to predict which companies are going to do well over the next 20 to 30 years. In fact, it's almost impossible to predict that. Um, a lot of active fund managers try to outperform the index and charge you exuberant management fees with a promise of higher returns. The thinking behind this makes sense. Uh, you know, the managers have an army of analysts working 12 hour days using the latest um, analytical tools and data sets to ensure that they can choose only the best companies to invest your money in. But as history has shown, only a very small percentage of investors slash fund managers are actually able to consistently beat the index over a long period of time. And we're talking, you know, uh, 15 plus years beating the index. There are a few that do it like Warren Buffett and whatnot, but majority of them don't beat the index when you account for the management fees that they, that, that they charge. So rather than trying to guess which investments will outperform in the future, index managers replicate a particular market or sector. This means that they invest in all or most of the securities in the index, with the theory being that investors as a group cannot beat the market because they are the market. But we're not trying to beat the market with index investing. We're just trying to ride the waves of the market because as we can see over a long period of time, the market trends up and that's the important part so it's going up we just want to be a part of that um trend <clears throat> sorry i'm i got a bit of a, <coughs> a chest cough here excuse me so next part of it is the etfs and vanguard um you know what what part do they play in this whole situation so if you want to how do you actually invest in in in, in an entire index I guess in theory, you could buy all the companies in the index at the appropriate weighting. You get killed in management and sorry, you get killed in brokerage fees, but I guess technically you could do it, but there's a way easier way. There exist these companies that cater for index investing styles and offer investment products that mimic an index with rock bottom management fees. One of the biggest investment companies that offer these products is Vanguard. And, you know, we've got beta shares in Australia and um, BlackRock and stuff like that. So there's, there's a few companies that do this. 
The reason that Vanguard and the other companies can offer these products at such a low cost is that there's no money spent on researching and analyzing which stocks to invest in. You think about a managed fund, like has its, its big point is that we've got the best analyst and we've got the best stock pickers, um, which are all getting paid like a ridiculous amount. I, I'm not sure exactly how much, but I think they work on commission. But Vanguard and all and beta shares and stuff, they don't have to pay this all these people to do all this research because they're not doing they're not trying to pick um, individual companies. All they're doing is getting the index data provided by such companies as S and P and removing or adding the companies in the index as they get the data plus a bit of paperwork and that's it. So just get that they just get the index data and say, you know, these are the top 200 companies in the ASX. All right, we're going to remove that one that dropped out. We're going to add this one in this this come in and the appropriate weightings and off you go. That's, you know, it's it's super simple. So the index company is really doing all the work and Vanguard and all these other um <coughs> ETF providers are just plugging in the information. That's why they can provide such a low management fee and to put the management fees into perspective a hedge fund fee might be as high as two percent whereas vanguard charges me 0.04 percent for my us index etf that i invest in 0.04 it's an incredibly low uh, management fee or to put it in another way if i had a million dollars in a hedge fund they would charge me 20k a year on two percent for management fees Whereas Vanguard would charge me four hundred dollars for that USN index, that's a difference between that's a difference of nineteen thousand six hundred dollars. And if you were to reinvest that that much money at eight percent return over thirty years, that's a difference between of two point four million dollars over thirty years through management fees. So management management fees definitely add up over a long period of time. Um, and you can either invest in Vanguard's fund or you can buy an ETF which is exactly the same investment product but ex- but traded on the stock exchange. I've got a link to a um, article that explains that a little bit better. So why we decided why did we ultimately decide to move to index investing? So <clears throat> a few points I won't go into them in detail that they, they are in the article but it was mainly um, diversification you know our three fund portfolio, has exposure to 6,000 companies over 30 different countries, um, whereas our properties are all located within Australia. They're in different states, but you know, not very diversified. Um, liquidity is a big one. To get my money out of um, real estate might take me like a year to sell and get my money, whereas the um, on the stock market and the ETFs, I can literally put in a sell order and have the money in my account within two days. That's extremely liquid and also means that you can <clears throat> live off capital gains. Like it's actually possible to live off capital gains in a practical way because the because they're so liquid. Um, third point is cash flow, which is probably the biggest reason why we made the move. The path towards financial freedom is a lot clearer with ETFs. Uh, we know exactly, we know we need roughly, sorry, a million dollars in the market to generate enough returns each year to live off forever. The high cash flow liquidity makes index investing a popular choice among uh, fire chasers. And that's, you know, you don't get that high cash flow through real estate unless you're buying crazy yield rentals or something like that. Uh, fourth point was no more banks. So that was like, r- Dealing with banks is just so annoying. Anyone that's done it, anyone that's, you know, got loans, withdraw equity a few times, it's just a lengthy process and um, leverage can have its place, but <clears throat> it's really not required. Um, and I really love the fact that I don't need the banks to continue investing. So that's a good one. Um, the passive income, you know, real estate, it, it's it can be passive to a certain extent, but it will never be as passive as ETFs. That was a huge bonus um, just to see the dividends roll in every single um, quarter or whatever it is. Um, that was a big one. And lastly, we don't have to be an expert. I think if you're going to invest in real estate, you really need to know your shit. Like I wouldn't be comfortable investing in property unless I knew all the ins and outs of the area, like the back of my hand. Where are the jobs coming from? What's the economy of the area? What's the population, population growth like? 
what's the unemployment rate like and on and on and on I could go. When we buy the ETFs, we don't need to know anything because the because we're investing in the index, you don't need to spend all your time thinking about what stocks are hot and you know what are, what's going to tank, what's going to go well. The only thing we need to worry about every single time we buy is rebalancing our portfolio. That's it. So every single time we buy, we look at how much our three funds are taking up and which fund we need to buy. That's all we need to do. No investment, uh, invest in <clears throat> expertise required, which is something that took me a while to get my head around and fully um, accept that you know I don't need to be researching uh, investing to make a really good investment decision. Um, if I just track this index and invest in this index, it should over a long period of time return something between somewhere between eight and nine percent. Um, so that's a positive for people that really don't care about investing, but they want to have a decent, you know, they want to set themselves up for retirement, but they don't want to do the work to um, educate themselves, which you really need to do in real estate. Like you can't get around that. Um, so yeah, that was a, another reason. Um, so, <clears throat> so now I want to go into uh, our plan detailed and exactly what we buy and why we buy it um, and how it's going to uh, get us to financial independence. So if you read um, the monthly net worth post that I publish each month, you can see that we invest in a three fund portfolio and I'm going to go into details about each fund and why we invest in them. But before I do, I just want to make uh, a point that management fees is something that I prioritize um, almost above everything else because it's a guaranteed return and it's something, it's it's a known um factor with investing whereas nearly everything else is speculation to a certain degree so the mer the management expense ratio management expense ratio or the management fees basically um is really i put that at the forefront when i'm when i'm choosing etfs like the mer is one of the most important things so given my obsession with uh, management fees you can understand that vanguard was an easy choice uh, for us to choose as an ETF provider since they have some of the lowest MERS in Australia. So this is what our strategy two. So we're in strategy two. Um, we are currently going for 40% of our portfolio to be um, VAS, which is Australian shares, 30% <clears throat> to be VTS, which is US shares, and 30% to be VEU, which is the whole world minus US, which includes a tiny portion of Australian shares, but only like 2%. So let me explain each fund, uh, each fund in detail and why it's in our portfolio. So the VAS shares has a MER of 0.14% and its benchmark is the S&P ASX 300 index. Really, some people will argue that Australia is such a small percent of the world's market that it's not diversified enough and you're better off going global, which... I agree to a certain extent, but the thing that keeps coming that draws us back to the Australian share market is really franking credits and its strong dividend yield. Um, I'm not going to go into franking credits too much, but Australia, for whatever reason, companies in Australia emphasize a higher dividend versus capital growth. I'm not 100% sure why this is. It's just It just is the way it is. I'm sure someone out there can explain it to me. Um, the dividends and the franking credits, which I have a link to a really good article that explains franking credits, but long story short, it, franking credits are a unique um, advantage that Australian companies can offer Australian investors, and it's too good of an opportunity to pass up on. The, with a strong dividend yield already of Australian companies, plus the franking credits, you get a really, really good dividend yield from from these um, these shares. So forty percent is really our cash flow king portion of the portfolio. Um, <clears throat> without the franking credits, I don't know if we would do Australian shares. To be honest, uh, that is really like the X factor there. Um, but I guess we'll see how we go. But the, the, the franking credits and the strong yield is, is definitely why we have such a high percentage of our portfolio in VAS. Now, just on that, BetaShares actually released a new ETF called the A200. 
which we will actually be transitioning to if Vanguard don't respond next time we go to buy the Australian shares. Now, the A200 was a big deal in the FIRE community because the MER, the management expense ratio, comes in at 0.07%, which is half that of what Vanguard can offer at, for the VAS, the, the equivalent, basically. The, the VAS and the A200 are slightly different, but all, for all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. Um, we, that's just way too good to pass up. And I'm surprised that Vanguard haven't responded um, to this already because I just can't see, I can't see an argument why you would choose um, VAS over the A200 when the A200, you're literally paying double the management fees for the Vanguard's version of the Australian um, index. So we'll be moving to beta shares if they don't respond next by the next time we buy. The next fund is VTS, which is the US market. Now, it's plenty diversified. I think the US take up like 40% of the entire world's market. It's insane. Um, it's really good. It's got good returns, you know, and the best thing I like about VTS is it's rock bottom MER. So it's the MER for VTS is 0.04% crazy crazy low it's my the lowest mer i think i can't remember i can't think of another etf in australia that has a mer that low um so i had thought about going 100 percent vts before because of its low mer but the franking credits keep pulling me back to um the australian market and to get complete w world exposure we come to veu which is the last etf that we invest in so it's MER is 0.11%, which is respectable. Um, and that's just in there in our portfolio to really cap off that global diversification. Um, so we're pretty much covered for unless there's a whole, you know, world meltdown like 2008 or something like that. So that's pretty much um, the <coughs> three funds, our three funds in a nutshell. Now, I want to point out that we are so diversified. We... For us to lose all our money, companies like Apple, Google, Microsoft, Exxon, Facebook, Commonwealth Bank, Shell, Samsung, like you get the idea. All the big companies in the world, like 6,000 companies, would all have to go bust for us to lose all our money. Think about how many people are employed and how many services that the top 6,000 companies in the world offer to the world. It's just insane. Like I just cannot see a scenario where they all go bust. Now, there's a very good chance that a few of those companies could go bust, a very good chance. But because the index, own, with the index investing, there's such a small weighting to individual companies, like most of the time, less than 1%. So the companies that go, do go bust, and, and there will be some, you don't really see it affect the, the portfolio as much as you would think. Because if they do go bust and they're only taking up a very small percent of the weighting they just sort of disappear out of the index and you do lose the money for for that company but what as like a a rebound what will happen is a company that's a bit small might sneak into the very end of the index and then go through the roof with um like it might the, the growth of the company just might explode and you do see a little bit of that as well but you don't see as much because you're only invested the weighting of that company is very small. So it all evens itself out. So um, over time, the market you know goes up and down, up and down. But again, the fundamental principle is that the index will trend upwards given a long enough period of time. So the 4% rule. So now we're on a rule that was based on a 1998 paper called the Trinity Study, which... <clears throat> Long story short, I won't go into it too much, but it basically means that you can live off 4% of your portfolio value. So if you have a million dollar portfolio, you can live off 40K a year and your money will never run out. Now, there's a whole bunch of things to like, don't take that as the as gospel, um, but that is the rule that we are sort of um, using to, to like get to our fire number, right? So Four percent. If you got a million dollars, you can live off forty grand. If you got two million dollars, you can live off eighty grand, and so on. So, how much do we need? So, this financial year, we spent just a touch under fifty k, which included everything, which also factored in rent. So, if we take out the rent, because our plan is to actually have a fully paid off house as well, we actually spend about thirty eight k a year. 
which would mean we need a fully paid house and about $950,000 in ETFs to generate enough income each year, factoring in inflation as well, to become financially independent. But being on the conservative side, I think we just say that we need a cool $1 million plus a fully paid house off to be financially independent. So that is our number, a million dollars with a house paid off. So how's this actually going to work? This part of it, you really need to read the um, the article to see the graphs and everything. But um, basically, the three funds will generate enough um, income either via dividends or and the tricky bit is through capital gains as well so the vas portion of the portfolio is a really really strong cash flow whereas the vtu and the v veu sorry and the vts is more capital gains so majority of our income every year will be hopefully topped up by vas but there's also the need in our strategy to sell units of veu and vts which I can almost hear people, you know, why why are you selling? I thought you weren't meant to sell when you reached your goal. But you got to look at the graphs. But basically, um, the capital gains um, generated by those two funds, the VTS and the VEU, um, you, you basically sell units, <clears throat> sell enough units um, to fund your lifestyle. And as long as you give the portfolio enough time to recover those losses, you shouldn't run out of money. That's the theory being that you you let them uh, build up capital gains and then you sell a few units, you get that money back and then you can let the portfolio recover, give it enough time and it should make up those numbers or should make up those that um, capital over the next year or over the next couple months, whatever it is. Now, there is an issue with this strategy that if we were to retire and then it, the market went into a huge um, crash like 2008, we would we would have to sell too many units to um, like the the portfolio wouldn't recover in time, which means that we might have to go back to work, which is the worst case scenario, which isn't even really that bad. But um, that's um, that's basically how it's going to work. We're going to get a whole bunch of dividends from VAS, which we're going to live off. Um, and then we're going to have to sell a few units from either VTS or VEU, uh, depending on which one did better. And then um, in each year as well, the units are worth more. So you're not like in the example I have in the post, um, I have to sell 25 units to make up the $4,829 that I that we were short for that year. But <clears throat> when the the portfolio actually grew in this example by $131,000 $131, and we actually took out of that portfolio $38,950 to live on, which still leaves us um, $92,326 up. So even though we took that all that money out to live on the base of our portfolio in dollar terms is actually higher than it was at the start of the year which means even though we have less units if we get the same return based on percentage as the previous year we'll actually end up with more money even though we have less units sort of hard to understand but um if you read the post it it explains it better but um yeah the, the units theoretically should be worth more every single year so you're selling less and less units every single year to to live off those units so how many did i say in this so in in my example um how many did i say in my example oh yeah here it here it is so we have over eleven thousand units in in the example that i use in the in the post so it's highly unlikely that we will have to sell all of those. Like it's, it's, it won't happen. In the, the very first year will be the most amount of units that we'll ever have to sell, 25 units. And, you know, that's not a lot at all. So with 11,000, unless there was a huge crash like 2008 and we have to sell a whole bunch of units at a really, really low cost, um, that would be the only way that this would um, come undone. And if that was to happen, if there was a bear market or a huge crash, I would 
probably not sell and I'd probably just you know pick up some work or some part-time work to to cover those um you know selling low um <coughs> so I've already gone what happens if we retire and another GFC hits I've already gone into that um so yeah so retirement will come when we hit the portfolio of a million dollars and we've got a fully paid off house that's when I will announce uh, I'll declare at that point that we are financially independent. Um, and then we just, you know, what do we do then? We live our lives to the fullest. Um, we basically do whatever we want. Uh, the odds of us, me and my partner, both not working are low, to be honest. Um, I really think that we will still have an income from some form of work, but it will just be work that is only ever enjoyable. Like uh, we'll never work for money that's unenjoyable, if that makes sense. So um, I think that having that huge portfolio there as like a safeguard will always be there and will always be awesome, but it won't be, we won't rely on that as much as we think we will, is my theory. Like if you read any of the um, early retire blogs, nearly all of them say that they earn some other form of income once they retire that was unexpected so i think that will happen to us as well but it'll always be good knowing that we've got full financial independence backing us up um and we could you know just quit our jobs or do whatever so um that's good now that is the full strategy of how we're actually going to do it but i want to talk about potentially strategy three because i think i'm a, I'm a big believer in you know, adopting new strategies if they make sense and there's no reason to pigeonhole yourself into one strategy. So the third strategy is by a guy called <clears throat> Peter Thornhill. Now, I'm going to really go over this really briefly, but if the entire reason that I invest money is to reach the end goal of financial independence, and that is to have my assets generate enough income from me and my partner to live off forever wouldn't it make sense to only invest in assets that produce a high income that makes sense vts and veu predominantly return capital gains versus dividends whereas vas is the cash flow king out of the three because of the australian index and australia has the higher rate of dividends and its franking credits so Peter Thornhill is this guy, he's an author of the bestseller Motivated Money, which details his investment approach to investing uh, for dividends, mainly in the um, industrial sector and not for capital growth. He's very, very big on um, uh, cash flow being the, um, the true value of a share, which, and if you read his book and you listen to it, some of his videos, it really just, it struck a chord with me and it really just made sense with me that in intrinsic value, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, intrinsic value um, should really be determined by the company or any investments um, ability to generate income over a long period of time. And it's the income that's the key uh, and it's the income that will pay the investor the dividend or be retained by the company and consequently have the share price go up. Now, a lot of these companies, and US companies especially, they do actually have strong income, but <clears throat> for whatever reason, the trend overseas seems to be to retain the income. So the company has made a decision to say, we're not going to pass this income onto the shareholders. We're going to retain it and grow the company. And as a result of them doing that, well, this is how it should work the share price can go up or will go up. So if there's a really strong um, history with that company of growing its income each year, um, you should see its price, its share price go up, even though they might not pay a high dividend. Now, we know just human nature, um, you know, people tend to speculate and that's not always how it works. Um, you get assets that have potential, but no solid foundation of cash flow being traded for heaps of money like Bitcoin and Sydney real estate. Now, I'm not saying they don't have value, but the only way an investor can make a decent return off these ass, uh, off these investments is if they find someone that's willing to pay a higher price than what they paid for it. When you think about it, you know, 
my first investment strategy was based on that principle. It's like I buy all these properties and then hopefully 10 years later, I can sell them to someone at a higher price. There's no way I would have made money um, had it been another case. And same with like Bitcoin. And I don't, I don't want to get into Bitcoin, but you know, it's good. it produces nothing. Like it, there is no income that it generates. So the only way you can make money is if you sell to someone at a higher price. You know, I, that's not the way I want to invest and I just don't feel comfortable doing it like that. So Thornhill is sort of like a 100% Australian <clears throat> Australian stock sort of guy. Australian share, shares have the best dividend yield and, th- and the most important thing is they give the bonus of franking credits. So when you combine these two high dividend yield and the franking credits, they make a really good argument for any Aussie investor to just go 100% Australian stocks. Now, I'm not 100% sold <laughs> on this strategy just because of the whole diversification and everything like that. But the more I listen to Peter speak and explain this strategy, the more it does make sense. Um, you know, I'm not relying on having to sell units to fund my retirement. It's just 100% all dividend income. Um, and yeah, it's basically, you know, do I want to sell units to live in retirement or do I want to rely solely on dividends? And the more I think about it, the more I think I only want to rely on dividends. So we haven't adopted strategy three yet, but it's something in the back of my mind that, you know, I'm constantly thinking about. So um, wrapping up, I just want to, you know, hopefully that, hopefully I haven't rabbled on too much, but you can get a better understanding of how we are making our investment decisions and the thought and the process behind them and, um, you know, how they're ultimately going to enable us to reach financial independence so we can retire early. So I guess concluding our, um, our fire, our official fire number is a million dollars with a house paid off. Um, and you know, I, I think it's still a few years away until we reach that goal, but you know, each year, each month we're, we're getting closer and closer to the destination. So, um, and I'm having a lot of fun along the way, sharing it with you guys. And I hope you guys are enjoying, uh, the journey as much as I am. So it would be really cool if you want to, you know, if you've got a similar strategy or, or on, or on the same path or a completely different path, I'd really like to hear about it in the comment section of that article. Um, and I hope you enjoyed it until next time.